Good morning. Hello. Hey, get your barbecue plate if you want one. Sweet. Yep, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the story. Hello. I'm getting feedback. Is it on me or you? I think it's me. I think it's me. It might be because of how hot it is for you. Back up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're going to get started. Good morning. Welcome to the story. To our one person in here and everybody online. What's up? What's going on? It's good to have you. I love it. Uh, we, we start the story off with a video every single time. And so we're going to go ahead and get that going. raised right here in this church and then uh, went to college and then quit going to church for the longest time and then uh, I was asked to come back to a smaller church and that's really where my church service started. Uh, I was a PPR chair for 10 years at this church, chairman of the board, chairman of the finance committee, chairman of trustees at one point in time and also the chairman of the cemetery committee. It has not always been easy. Uh, my experiences have been god-awful at times, the way that people get treated within the church. I have been hurt by the church. Uh, I related to Pastor Kenneth's message really well the other day because uh, I, I like to say I've had every knife stuck in my back from a butcher knife to a butter knife. Uh, but you just have to keep going. And yes, the church is a good place and people are not always the nicest people in the world. You know, God said that we should love one another as we love ourselves and that's the key. Because number one, you have to be able to look in the mirror every morning and love yourself before you can expect to love others. Jesus had every person in the spectrum as his followers, from the ta tax collectors to the prostitutes to the poor fishermen. But you know, I can only imagine there was a few arguments and fussing and fighting and that sometimes people weren't the nicest to one another. And that's okay, we're just human. And so now you have all these personalities within the church that are just as different as night and day, trying to get along. Well, that's not easy to do unless you truly, truly love yourself and are able to take a look at this and say, you know what, I love them. I might not like that personality, but I don't have to be ugly and we can all get along and we can move forward as a church because that's why all God wanted. Like I said, I worked for the church for 10, 12 years. I left out all, all the way. I, I gave it all up because it got to be too much for me to handle the ugliness within the church. It took me 10 years after it was all over with. Uh, I've spent a lot of time reflecting on the things that I did and I have learned to look myself into the mirror, look myself into the eyes. If I don't like the person that's looking back at me, I do what it takes to try to change that part that I do not like. It was hard at first, but after a lot of reflection, a lot of praying, a lot of sitting on my front porch thinking about those days that were so bad to me in the church, yeah, I did have some fault. I did. I finally realized that sometimes I didn't like the man in the mirror and started making those changes. I still got a long way to go. I've made great strides in that. I've made great strides with dealing with people in the church uh, because people in the church have to deal with me. Come on. It's a two-way street that I found out. Yeah. And so the more love I show them, the more love I get back. And that's a good feeling. Not that the fact that, you know, that I needed to hear it, but they love me enough to come by 
in just a few words uh, made me feel good for the day. It made me realize that there's maybe I need to show the love somewhere else because right now it's probably the happiest I've been in a long time with, the, with myself and with the church because I have found a way to love myself that I can love others and not have to deal with or take it personally when somebody comes up to me and is real ugly to me or says something I don't like. I can love that person now because I love myself and I don't have to react like I used to. I'll tell you something else. I had cancer back in uh, 2000. It was a very bad cancer. I was at a small church and they knew what I was fixing to go through. I haven't been through the surgery or I hadn't been, you know, all I knew is what I had and how we were going to fix it. And then next thing you know, all of a sudden I had a hand laid on me from an old, older member of the church. Well, then that one turned to two, turned to three. And finally, the whole congregation lay in the hands. They didn't have to do that. That was them showing their way of loving me. Not, a, not one person said not one thing. They didn't have to. I knew I was loved. And so those are powerful things. You don't, like you said, you don't have to say anything. A simple act kindness, a simple act of love. It's not that hard. Only you got to love yourself first. And if you're not there, maybe you need to look in the mirror every morning and make some changes. Man, that was good. I really resonated with uh, um, Was talking about uh wow I completely drew a blank. It'll come to me if it does. Let's worship the Lord. <laughs>
feel like it preaches like the whole gospel. I'll be reading scripture for us today. It's out of Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, 
a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put them on his own animal. He put, he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers, he said. The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So red flag religion is, is, um, is the series that we're in right now. And I really, I really like that because... When you, when you break that down, um, a lot of times people on the outside of church, I might just use that. This is, I don't know how he's <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. So uh, when you really break that down, um, people on the outside of church, a lot of people that you know, don't don't necessarily want to trust the religion part of church. Um, get that feeling, that sense of um, there's a red flag. There's there's a red flag. Uh, I don't want to open myself up to being hurt. And um, there's so many different ways that religious trauma can can occur. So many different ways. And this story ties so well into it because it teaches us how to fix that issue, fix all of those issues, and how to become uh, not only better people but better Christians. Yeah. Um, so how, I know we just heard it, but how do y'all remember the story of the Good Samaritan, when you really think about it, like what does it do to you when you read it? I've, I've always been deeply moved by uh, the end when, when Jesus says, go and do likewise. Yeah. That's always the first thing I think of because it's like, you know, imagining it in today's scenario, in today's circumstances, like, you know, especially with, with all the tension in America with, like, race and all the things that have been happening the past 10 years, um, it resonates to see, you know, that good Samaritan come along, and, and he knows that, you know, the people around him probably don't care for him for his ethnicity, but that didn't matter because, you know, he knew that that person needed help. And seeing Jesus say, go and do likewise, just always like hit me in the heart. And it, 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 it it's really simple to, yeah. you know, to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it, the irony, I think the irony here is that in the minds of the first two people that pass by him, they're not helping for religious reasons. Mm -hmm. They're too worried about being oh, wow. becoming unclean by touching someone that's bleeding or hurt or dirty. And, and they can't help because in their mind, as warped as it is, in their mind, they're doing the godly thing by avoiding this sin, avoiding this dirtiness, this filth, and going on their way. That's wild. And... The Samaritan comes along who was despised by these Jewish people and, and this person is the one that shows mercy, that shows love. This person who in the minds of those 
religious elites is, is the bottom of the barrel. They're the one that actually does what God would want us to do. And when Jesus says, go and do likewise, he's talking to a person that's one of those elitists. So there's got to be a little bit of stinging, you know, in, in hearing that. Wow. That's an awesome way to He's interpret basically it. saying, hey, that person you hate, go be like them. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, that, like I, so what I was going to say was that Pastor Kinnon had, had preached a sermon a while back on this, and it stuck with me because I was able to look at it in a different way than I normally did. And it was because of that. He was like the Samaritan was that person's enemy. So all the people that you think would be his allies in that moment that, would, that should be able to pick him up, walk past him, but the one person that would be like his nemesis because of like because of the context and all that was the person to step out of the way which is why in the parable it meant i think so much to that person he was talking to because he was like look at it from the perspective of someone that is like totally against you stepping out of the way and, and showing you mercy and then of course like jesus does a lot of times is like you know, what do you think is the right answer and right. has you answer the question and it's usually like well it's the samaritan who's you know that's the and he's like go and be like that which is awesome I love the way Jesus will like, he'll like turn it around on you, dude. He's like, he's like, uh, like the exact point you just, I love how he turns things around. So we would hear this a lot in religion class when I was little. And I didn't take like, I didn't understand the priest, the Levite and the Samaritan, like their backgrounds and all of that. But what I did take from it was you can be a good person. It's your choice to do that. So that was like, okay, so I can choose to be good in any situation I find myself in. So I like that as a child. Yeah, come on. So um, I, I have two things to say. First of all, um, I, I totally believe you about the hymn and the uh, hymnal because when I was processing <laughs> the word Pisca, Mount, whatever, I was like, how do I say that? Like in my brain, I was trying to figure out how to sing it. I'm not exactly sure if I got it right, but it, it still was like, I've never seen that word before in my life, or, and I've sung the song tons of times. Anyway, the second thing is it makes me think of the para that um that was for ESS next door to one of my classrooms, and um and I guess I should say this backwards then to kind of tell it forwards. But um after speaking with the the child in question, after speaking with her first grade teacher, so I was music right, so ancillary, so they only came to me like once or twice a week. And um, after speaking with the teacher, she said, oh, yeah, she's been crying about her teeth for like a month and no one has done anything about it. And now I feel like a horrible person. And I was like, don't feel like a horrible person. It was her teeth, you know, but like when she came to me one day, um, she was crying about her teeth, she's sitting in the front of the room crying about her teeth. And I had another kid in the back of the room who was walking around hitting stuff and making noise. And so I asked the para from next door to come help and to take one of them. You know, I was like, I can teach music with, with a kid crying or I can teach music with a kid making noise, but I can't teach music with a kid crying and making noise. You know, like, that's just not possible. Mm -mm. So she was like, well, I'll, te I'll take the crying kid, you know, or I'll take the kid making noise because I know him. And, um, and then she said, but hold on. And she went and got her latex gloves and started feeling around in this child's mouth. And I was like, nope. 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 Nope, that's not me. And like, and that's kind of what it makes me think of is that like, is that she was willing to go that extra, you know, mile yeah. and, and like go feel around in her mouth. And then she was like, Mayo, get over here and look at this. I was like, no, Mayo does not teach. <laughs> Mayo doesn't mouth. And she was like, get over here and look at this. And I was like, okay. And, and I went over and looked and, you know, we figured out why she's been crying all this, all this time. And, you know, we did the right things to get it all fixed. She's better because... That woman had the the Compassion. mindset that it wasn't a gross thing. It wasn't her mouth. It she wasn't, took it was, the time to help. It was a problem and we solved it. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm going to be a good person and, and help this kid fix it. I'm not afraid of her. You know, and I know that's yeah. not the same, but it's, it always makes me think of that. That yeah. Perkins just, I mean, like a boss, just went and got her latex gloves and said, let's look. <laughs> that's awesome. So another, you know, when, when we were taking notes on this, uh, on what Dwayne was preaching, you can, um, you can also think of where, where are you in this story? And you can think, 
back throughout your life that you may have been one of each of these people. You could have been the two that passerbys and you could also be the one that was beaten. You could have been the one that was helping. And um, the moral is, is to get to where you're the one helping. Because uh, we've all been in a place where we were the one beating, beaten, and we were the ones that were passing by. And we were the ones where we need to be now, are the ones helping. Um, so like s- some examples of religious trauma, for me at least, um, I remember when we were looking for a church uh, out here, we went to one particular church and um, I, I had never felt um, so out of place and like, what are you doing here mm-hmm. kind of feeling. And um, I never, ever wanted to step foot in that church again. And that was a really hard thing to go through, a really hard it hurt. It yeah. really hurt. And I can only imagine how, how people have felt in the past um, just for even worse things that have happened in the church. Because religious trauma, it, it's, not, it's not something that is um, just defined, uh, d- defined by one thing. It could be many, many, many things. And... Um, what are, what are some things that, that y'all have experienced um, that you've had to overcome um, for things like that? The list is too long. <laughs> the list is too long. <laughs> the list is too long. But the one takeaway that I had from the issues that have happened is the small voice that says, I need you to be there. Somebody needs to see that you're not going to leave. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's just one person that needs to see that. Yeah. Because the kingdom of God is made by personal response. That's it. It's not made by a group. It's by a congregation. It's made one person at a time. The more that, but yeah. Yeah, I wrote, you, you can adjust in small ways. Um, you can adjust in small ways, and it doesn't have to be a huge adjustment. It's just that one step at a time. To, to show that you're staying. I love that. I love what you just said. That was awesome. awesome. That's great. I think I needed to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> just one person. You don't have to worry about everybody. <laughs> you know, you can take the priest and the Levite and the Muslim and put it in modern times. Mm-hmm. Like, you can use it as the president of the governor. That's it. I think, and I, I think that one person at a time thing, that's biblical. Because mm-hmm. uh, one thing that stuck out to me majorly uh, when I was just contemplating things, I was reading the Bible, and I came to the part where Jesus said, if you, did, if you do any of these for the one of the least of these, my mm-hmm. brothers, you did it for me. And that one really stuck out to me because, you know, I, I have, me personally, I have a tendency to, want to do it big and like, you know, let's go 
like like especially when I first got saved, like I wanted to go, I wanted to go preach to the mall, you know, I wanted to stand up in a restaurant. And all of those things are fine and they're good, but I found great peace and great comfort when Jesus said, if you do any of these, if you do any of this for one of the least of these, you did it for me. So that one at a time is biblical, in my opinion. John, whenever John and I were recording the video for this week, um, he kind of opened my eyes to something that I feel like I've always known, but like it was just good to hear someone else talk about it, was, um, was like was showing love in, in action was sometimes you don't have to say a whole lot. Sometimes just being there for somebody and putting a hand on a shoulder and just like going that little extra bit for that one person or whatever. And that's what he said at the end was he was like, I was around a whole congregation of people and I felt like they said it a lot of times, but it was until that moment where I was at my lowest and everyone came around me and put their hands on me and just showed me that they loved me. It meant more to me than anything else. And I was like, that's so true. There's been so many times in my life where I feel like people have said things, but sometimes whenever I needed someone just to be there for me, that meant more to me than anything else. And that, I think, mm-hmm. is something that I've, I've, like, I've just kind of reignited in me this week as I was thinking about it that I need to overcome. I think it's really interesting as we think about serving God, as we think about ministry and to people out there, Mm-hmm. how that looks that person that was laying there bleeding the fact that those people went to church every time the door was opened and they did all the right things and said all the right prayers and washed and cleansed themselves religiously that, that meant nothing to them mm-hmm. the fact that this person who was despised showed them mercy and love that's all they saw and sometimes we just get so caught up in our selves looking about, you know, well, church this, church that, you know, I got to do the right things and, and all of this stuff. And really it's just about showing love, That's showing it. love and, and being there to serve and, and need. And, and it has nothing to do with the righteous things that we sometimes let fill our minds. That's awesome. Amen. We, um, we had a little Bible study yesterday, and we were talking about love. And uh, it just so happened to be people that I grew up in the church with. And um, I was just overwhelmed thinking about all the times that they showed me love, just unconditional love. And, um, you know, I, I explained to them that even though the times have changed and things are harder, we can still love. We, we can still show each other love. We can still show the, the people out laying in the gutter love. We can help as much as we can because our minds tend to want to venture off into the darkness and our, our hearts tend to follow that as well. But we've gotta, we've gotta reel it back in and show each other what God wants. Show each other how much God loves us and how much God loves them. And um, I really, I really enjoyed that. Really enjoyed that time. Um, another thing that John said that really uh, stuck out to me when he said, "You know, I've been, I've been stuck with a butcher knife. I've been stuck with a, a butter knife." Yeah. And that, that's cool. That. Uh, <coughs> That made me think, you know, some, some were huge, some were small, but they still hurt. They still hurt. They still caused problems. They still caused trauma, but I kept coming, and that's what that tied into what you were saying and what you were saying. Just, just keep, keep coming and um, keep loving. And I, I feel that here. I really feel that here. A lot, of, a lot of love in this church. But um, another note I took was, was uh, judgment, shame, lack of acceptance can easily cause religious trauma. And for me personally, what I was telling you about going, going to that one specific church 
it, it, all it takes is one time. One time to, to, to cause someone to just fall off the rails. And um, that hurt. It hurt tremendously. Uh, I, I went in there coming from a loving, a really loving background in a church and, and looking for somewhere closer and immediately being, being hit with judgment. I, I, can't, I can't begin to express how much it hurt. And um, I wanted to run out of there so fast. Yeah, yeah, being brought up in church. Yeah. Right. And it, it hurts, it hurts even more to think about it. Because it, like I said, it just takes that one, that one time. Mm-hmm. And you may never get them back. And so I, I, that's why I do love this story because the denarii, that's, uh, that was like one, one day's, day's wage, wage, right? Yep. And, and to give two and right. then to pay debts after that, that's beyond what that person could have asked for. That's huge. Yeah. And to do that out of, out of just love and sympathy and just wanting to do the right thing is amazing. Yeah. And, and taking examples of that, we need, we need to follow that. We need to follow that as much as, as much as we possibly can. That's what God wants. Amen. You know, and, and also when, when I was in youth, I had a great youth, awesome youth growing up. I was, the, I was brought up to love no matter what, to love everybody, even if it was a bad kid. You know, I was going to do my best to show how much I loved them and how much God loved them. That's how I was raised. And um, this one particular time, you know, I, and, and you, can, you can ask people that I was in youth with, I didn't have someone at youth that, I didn't know and that I wasn't friends with. I was friends with everyone. And I purposely went to the bad kid groups just so I could reel them in. And one particular time, one of the youth leaders uh, started telling people in, in the youth group to stay away from me because I was a bad kid. And I, I can't tell you how much that hurt. And um, it made me not want to go back. Like, just as a, as a younger kid, you know, something that small wanted me to just run away. Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't want anything to do with church because I felt like I was doing the godly thing. I felt like I was doing what was right for the church and what God wanted. And to be hurt by someone that I thought I thought, you know, we loved each other and um, something simple like that. I have a very, I've I've told this story a little bit here in in a very similar way that I was part of a worship team at a church that I grew up in that I had had been a part of for a long time. And I had that, I feel like I had that security like you were talking about, Mr. Dan, of like I felt, but I got really involved. I got really involved in the worship team and all that kind of stuff. And in that kind of, you know, late teens, early 20s time, I also was playing music outside the church with friends of mine. And, um, and I felt in my heart, I felt in my heart that, I, that even, though it was a, even though it wasn't a, um, even though it wasn't church, it wasn't a glamorous atmosphere, um, I felt like I was a, I was being a positive influence to friends that I really cared about, and I was showing them love when I feel like they didn't have that in their life, and they were going through substance abuse, or they were going through neglect or loneliness, and I felt like in my heart, I felt like me being there for them was the right thing, because I felt like that was what 
I felt like it was what God was leading me to do. And then to be a part of a ministry that, um, that didn't condone that and then started talking about, started talking down about my effectiveness and almost telling me that I was a bad kid right. for doing that. And I was like, I, I feel like you're telling me this, but I, but I feel like deep down that that's not, that, that, if, that what I'm doing is good. But whenever you're, but I come back here where I feel like I should be safe and I feel like I should be loved and I feel like I should come here to recharge and I feel like I'm, my leadership is being questioned mm -hmm. and I feel like my effectiveness as a worship leader is being questioned. And then it made it really hard to like kind of continue that where I was like, I, I feel like I'm being led to do that and I feel like I'm being led away from this, which is something that I feel like I've always been a part of and it was so weird and. It was such a hard time to kind of wrap my head around. Yeah. Yeah. And it was hard. It was hard at the time because I was... It was hard because it, yeah. even though like I even though I felt confident in my spiritual walk, I felt confident in myself. I was still young, and I think I was still impressionable and still learning a lot about like what it means to like be a leader in, in ministry in some way. And then so to have like a mentor, so I looked up to, and like word got back to me the things that he was saying behind my back. I was like, I feel betrayed. Sucks. I feel by trade by someone that I looked up to for a long time, and I was like, and it was hard to wrap my head around that because I was like, I feel like I'm getting more love outside the church than I am inside right now, which is hard to. Speak up. Absolutely. You know, just the, the quick sum up of what I was talking about in the, in, in the youth program, um, who, who my, who my uh, guy was that stopped to help me along the path when I was broken in that certain situation was uh, the actual youth pastor at the time. Um, he had noticed that I'd stopped coming to youth. He had noticed that I wasn't volunteering anymore. And um, he, he, he wanted to meet with me right away. You know, and he, he was like, what is going on? I told him everything. And he was like, look, I know where your heart is. God knows where your heart is. And he, he made me feel like what I, he put me back on track as, as what, um, 
where my heart was intended to be. And he, he's a big reason why I'm here doing what I'm doing now. Um, he, made it, he made it back aware where my heart was, was initially going, the direction it was initially going in, and what I was doing. Um, so we have the ability to break people down. We also have the ability to bring them back up. We all make mistakes. We've also got to forgive, let go, and we also have to reach out and help. So let's pray real quick. Yeah. Dear Lord, help us to be the helpers in every situation, the, the people that bring people back on track and help people bring um, them to you, Lord. Help to find you. Help us to be good people. Help us to be strong and courageous. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.